All right, well, it looks like we got a good group here today. I'm excited. I know it's a couple minutes before 11, but I thought we could be nice to go around and do intros before we officially start. Um, I'm Pastor Aaron, as you all know. <laughs> um, yeah, Hugh, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Oh, you're still connected to audio. Hugh, would you like to uh, uh, introduce yourself to the group real quick as we get started here? Okay. Yeah, just Hugh Kress, kind of the creator, I guess, of this little sessions that, that we're doing, um, member of Trinity and long time uh, connections and interests with Native Americans. Former educator, I guess, always an educator. As a teacher, always a teacher, it seems right. to me. Yeah. All right. Uh, Pete and Nancy, would you like to introduce yourselves real quick? Hi, I'm Nancy, and um, I'm going to be in and probably out because all of a sudden there's pandemonium at the house. Our grandchildren have arrived for like one hour on their way to Green Bay, so I'm hoping I'm going to be able to catch at least some, and I'll get the rest of the recording, but I'm really grateful um, for the attendance here today and excited for the message. Yeah, and I'm Pete, and, and I'm a member of Trinity, and, and I'm excited about this whole study. Cindy? Hi, I'm Cindy Mattingly, a member at Trinity, and I am I did listen to the first two weeks' recordings. Thanks so much for working on this, Hugh, and I'm excited to join this study as well. Uh, Fred and Char? Oh, Fred Kinsey, member of Trinity. Just an interesting subject, and I had some background in Native American uh, studies and literature. I'm Charlene Kinsey, and I'm just excited for the study, too. Nancy? Nancy, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. I'm Nancy Hikes. I'm from Calvary and Minocqua in Northern Great Lakes Synod. I'm a friend of Pete and Nancy's and a friend of Trinity's because I uh, and have met so many people participating in Monday Night Bible Study. So, um, and very excited, too, that you're doing this series. I was part of a group in our synod reading Unsettling Truths um, last winter and so appreciative of more learning and conversation. Awesome. Anita? Hi, Trinity member, um, longtime interest in all things Native American. Thanks. Matt? Um, I'm Matt Lick, um, member here at Trinity, and just real interested in broadening my knowledge of uh, Native Americans within Wisconsin and, and the nation, yeah. And our wonderful presenter today. Well, I don't know if I can live up to that. But I'm Greg Miller. Uh, I've been on the uh, Stockbridge Muncie Tribal Council for the last, I'm currently not on, but I used to be on for over 20, probably 25 years in one capacity or another. And I'm very uh, happy to be here today and, and thank you for putting this on. Uh, I'm Linda Miller, uh, wife to Greg and a member of Wilderness Lutheran Church on the reservation. And I'm happy to be here too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Miles Miller and I'm gonna play the flute for you guys today. Mm -hmm. This is also our grandson. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> so we were excited to have his company this morning, and uh, he spent the night with us, and he's just great company. Miles' name is Miles Oppermont Miller, which is Oppermont is a long, uh, it's a name that's been long in history in the tribe. My grandfather's name was that, and my grandfather. Um, went to Carlisle during the removal period. And an interesting story about Carlisle and my grandfather is that when he was there, he um, marched in the inauguration parade. They took the kids from Carlisle and he mar marched in the inauguration parade of Teddy Roosevelt. Mm. And in front of him was Geronimo marching. But Geronimo, was a prisoner of war. 
So he was on parade, not in the parade. And sometimes we talk about history and say, oh, things happened long, long ago. But that's not long ago. My grandfather died in 1949, but uh, those stories still live on. So Miles is going to play a little welcoming song for you. I'm glad that he was able to come along with us today. Uh, he's 13 years old. He goes to uh, Shano School, and uh, he's picked up the flute and started playing it. He does a pretty good job. So, Miles, you want to play us a welcome song? It'd be great. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. A few years ago, the tribe uh, put together uh, a story of the, the history of the tribe. And after I reviewed that a little bit, I thought, you know, that makes more sense to have you take a look at that. There's different voices. They tell the story. It shows a little about where we come from, about where we've been. And as I looked at it, the characters in the story, the characters telling the story kind of interests me. You'll see a young man in there that tells about that he grew up dancing and his life on the reservation. He now uh, was our, is our head, head judge. He went to law school. You'll see him, he's probably about 13, 14 years old in the video. He went to uh, law school in New Mexico and got his law degree and he'd come back on the res as our, our head judge. Uh, the one lady, the Dorothy Davids, is a professor from the University of um, Madison, who now has walked down the trail, walked down the path. But she was very active in Native American issues, women's issues throughout the state of Wisconsin diversity. She tells a part of the story. You'll see two ladies that tell a part of the story and their father, You'll see a picture in there of the National Congress of American Indians and when it was founded, Arvid Miller, he was one of the founders of the National Congress of American Indians, which is a national organization, which is very powerful right now in Indian country, or yet. Uh, he was also the founding member of the uh, Great Lakes Intertribal Council here in Wisconsin. And uh, in Wisconsin, we have 11 different tribes, federally recognized tribe, uh, we have the Brotherton tribes who are not recognized at this point, but are, are currently trying to do that. Uh, and I think uh, there's, mm, you might have to look this up on Google. That's one thing you, you can't tell stories because everybody can go on their phone and tell you you're telling a story or not. But I think there's 574 federally recognized tribes as we speak today in the United States. Uh, so. If we can get that video on, you take a look on it, and then we can do some question and answers after it, or some uh, take a look at a hard look at some of the points that they make on there. So I hope you enjoy the video, and uh, again, thanks for having me. A reminder if everyone could um, mute while we watch this just so that there's no background noise that would be great Sorry, working on it. 
it worked before. Sorry, technical difficulties as always. <laughs> I, I call this the pregnant pause. <laughs> <laughs> now, technology is always all the challenge. It's wonderful when it works. And I even um, tested it like 20 minutes ago to make sure yeah. that everything worked seamlessly. Um, maybe that's what went wrong. I should have just assumed it would be. Well, while you're working on that, I'll just say that I would like to come up to the uh, reservation next Wednesday. I think I asked Pastor Johnson about, about, about doing that. And I have a book that I have that was written by one of the teachers at the mission school uh, there on Mission Lake. They do it too from the Missouri Senate. His name is uh, Rich Richter uh, in terms of doing it. And I don't know if the museum has that book or not. So I'm going to try visiting the museum too. It's a very interesting perspective from one of the teachers at the mission school, you know, you know, in terms of doing that. So, so I hope to come up and um, to have somebody look at that book and it's kind of a different viewpoint from you know, and actually the students that were there. This is from one of the teachers. You know, it's, yeah, there's a actually a book called uh, Mission that was written by um, a party during the time that our tribe was settled in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And in that setting, it talks about the time that we settled there in a third party sense to the time there was no longer any more room there for us and it started our, our Western migration. Uh, it's an interesting book too. Uh, and I think there's a copy of that. I have a personal copy of that, but there is a copy of that book at um, the library uh, museum there. Um, and it would be interesting to compare the two from one 1734 to one in, must have been 59, 58, 56, the one you're talking about. So that'd be interesting to take a look at that. My mother uh, was at the, um, well, um, many of our people, my, my mother and father were at the mission school there. It was a Missouri Synod school. Right. And uh, unlike people who did not like that mission school experience, she always talks about the, the, the people in, that interacted, the students' interaction. She never talks much about the learning part of it, uh, but she talks about the interactions. And the school was on, was on the reservation, so that's another thing. Like the board, some morning, boarding schools, they boarded there but their right. homes were probably five or six miles away. So uh, the, she enjoyed the experience, but again, she never talks about the learning part of it. She talks about the interaction of the children that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, what we got out of it was she was a fantastic bread maker. <laughs> she has been making bread for the entire class, the whole school there since she was 12 or 13 years old. So, um, you know, that's basically what she talked about. They enjoyed the experience because of the interaction with the other kids. So I don't really recall how many of numbers that were there, uh, but you know, it was a, a substantial number. They had, they had, uh, they stayed there and um, went home, I guess, in the summers. So. Yeah, and this, this book All right, I think I got it to work. It should okay. be. <laughs> I'll be quiet then. Here we go.
The fire is our grandfather. It serves as a central light, sending forth many blessings and lessons. The campfire is a sacred place to pass on the teachings of our elders. See in the fire the values of our ways and pride. You are an ancestor of the Anishinaabe, the original people. Do honor to your people. Respect all people and the earth. Remember to respect yourself and the knowledge and goodness that come from your rich heritage. Grow up strong and contribute abundantly to your extended family of brothers and sisters. Pass on that which you determine to be good and truthful. I have seen many changes in my life. As Indian people, we will continue to survive and evolve. It is my hope that you and future generations will continue to pass on our values. This is our way of life. The Mini Trails design has become a symbol of hope and determination for the Mohican people. The Mini Trails that have been followed by the Stockbridge Muncie people are symbolized by the design. The design continually reminds all Mohicans of their past struggles to survive and their need to stay united to ensure the future of the tribe. The Stockbridge Muncie Reservation is a spirited community of over 1,500 tribal members of the Mohican Indian Nation. Tribal members and citizens of this progressive and modern community enjoy a good life. They live in an environment that offers generous natural resources and outstanding recreational opportunities. The North Star Casino and Bingo is one of the many experiences that visitors to the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation can enjoy. It is also largely responsible for many of the recent improvements seen within the community. The Mohican Indians have a deep, rich history and an identity that is quite unique. The people of the Stockbridge Muncie Band desire to be recognized and respected for both their differences and similarities to non-Indians. Here is their story. Many generations after the Great Turtle Island rose from the water, its story was still being shared among the people of the tribes of the vast eastern woodlands. One of these tribes was the Mahikonok. The name means place where the waters are never still. Their legends included stories of ancestors who journeyed from the north and west, crossing waters where the lands almost touched. The Mohicanoc, or Mohicans, flourished and grew to great numbers. The Mohican Nation, or Confederacy, enjoyed a bountiful harvest of a region rich with natural resources. Fish and game abounded. Trees, grains, vegetables, herbs, and medicines were plentiful. The Mohicans, like other native tribes, lived in spiritual connection with their environment and in harmony with the seasons. They lived along the Hudson River in the area now known as New England. Not very far away lived the Muncie Indians. They were part of the Delaware Confederacy and enjoyed a similar lifestyle to the Mohicans. The Mohican Indians suffered great losses in their history. In addition to their numbers, which are estimated to have dwindled by as much as 90%, the Mohicans lost their homeland. They essentially lost their culture, their language, and many of their sacred traditions. This was due primarily to the arrival of Europeans and their desire to acquire land, colonize its inhabitants, and eventually remove the Indians from their native lands. In northern Wisconsin, the Mohicans still live in a community called Stockbridge Muncie. Their story, like their many trails tribal symbols suggest, is one of courage and perseverance. The people of Stockbridge Muncie have witnessed more adversity than any group of people ever should, and yet they have endured. For the first time in many centuries, they have occupied a place long enough for it to be considered their homeland. John W. Quinney was an ardent activist, reformer, and great spokesman for the Stockbridge Mohicans. He traveled often to Washington lobbying to Congress, seeking improvements and fairness for his people. On July 4, 1854, John Quinney delivered a speech. It is still revered by the Stockbridge Muncie Band today. 
He related the severe injustices that resulted from the many dealings with the United States government. He also issued a strong plea for fairness. He mentions that our people settled on the Mahikanetak, or what is referred to today as the Hudson River, named after Henry Hudson. Our people settled there because it reminded us of our nativity. We have thought about many different ways of what he might have meant by that. Native people across this land have their own creation stories. If you can believe that God created Adam from the dust of the land and then made Eve out of his rib, then what is so difficult to believe that the Creator sent a woman through a hole in the sky or that a great turtle came out of the water and there was dirt and it grew and grew and grew. All Indian people believe that North and South America are the Turtle Island and it's made on a turtle's back. So there are many creation stories in different tribes and I just tend to believe that any one of those creation stories can be true, including Adam and Eve. Henry Hudson sailed up the Mahikanatuck River, which they now call the Hudson River. The Mohican people were the ones who went aboard on his ship and welcomed him to come with their, into their villages. And uh, that's what changed everything. Henry Hudson, a Dutch trader, set up a fur trading post in this land that was so rich in furs like beaver and otter. As the animals became less abundant, tensions increased between tribes who were competing for European goods. A popular trade commodity supplied by the early European traders was rum. Europeans soon realized that alcohol could be used to their advantage by exploiting its effect on the Indians. Imported diseases, foreign to the Indians, wiped out great percentages of the original inhabitants' populations. Our people, after being so decimated from, from disease and wars and whatever, were so few that they decided that they should ask to be educated so we would know what we were signing. Learn to read and write so we would know what was happening. And to, to go to churches because it seemed like we had to join the people who had come to this country. So they asked for a missionary and over a few matter of time they received one and John Sargent was that first missionary. But as more and more Europeans came and more people wanted to live in there, we learned the word covet and we learned in school what mortgage and debt and loan meant. It was things that were totally foreign to us. In about 1730, the Mohicans, because they were pretty much landless, moved eastward into their own territory, but on the Housatonic River. And there they be started to be called the Housatonic Indians. When we're on the, when the Hudson River, which is, they called the Mahikani Tuck, we were the Mohican Indians. When you get the Housatonic, they become the Housatonic River Indians, and eventually, when the English come and they rename it after a little town in Stockbridge, we got to be known as the Stockbridge Indians. The Mohicans were thoroughly colonized in the East. We lost our language. You know, you shouldn't be talking that language, speak English, you know. We were looked upon as being offensive to the missionaries, so we must be offensive to God. But anyway, and so we were offensive in so many ways and we had to be changed. But you know and I know that, in, that people of color all over the world, although they changed, never became equal. Even now, we're never looked upon that way. But we did become slaves. We did become subjects. We did become dependent. We became all the things desired in the colonial process. Now, I tell that because that's what happened to the Mohicans, and that's why we've been removed eight times in our life. Each time we thought we'd settle down, there was some reason to move us. 
Um, now those are long stories. So we're trying to throw off that, that colonialism and be nations as we are constitutionally. The United States Constitution recognizes us as nations. And that's where we Mohicans are. After we learned the concept of land ownership, now I need something to survive. And I go and ask the man if he will give me some money so I can have food for my family. He says, sure, I'll help you, but you have to say that if you don't pay this back that I can have your land. I mean, it took us a long time to get over this. New York State was the same thing. Everybody got a lot assigned to them, and we sold it off for survival. And that's when we got to Stockbridge, Wisconsin, it was the same thing. First thing they do was map and sign allotments. And then after we got to Red Springs, everybody had their 40 acres. We fought over all of this stuff all the while, and we lost it. Then the allotted land under the Allotment Act was actually to dissolve tribes. Mm -hmm. I was told by an Indian lawyer when I took the Indian gaming law, I had never heard this before, that allotment also separated families. You couldn't get an allotment next to your mother. They'd put you on the other side of the reservation. And that was a way to split us up. The move to New York, where the Stockbridge accepted an invitation from the Oneidas, who offered them some of their land, was just the first in a series of removals that would eventually bring the Stockbridge Muncie to Wisconsin. Even in Wisconsin, land acquisition by settlers moving west and seeking prime farmland forced the Mohicans to move again from the west side of Lake Winnebago to the east side, where the town of Stockbridge still exists today. It was at about this time that the Muncie, who were also being driven westward, joined the Stockbridge, a forced attempt by the federal government to relocate Indians to the west of the Mississippi caused many more to die. The Indian Removal Act all but destroyed the once proud and powerful Stockbridge and Muncie nations. In the Treaty of 1856, the Stockbridge and Muncie moved to the area where their reservation would eventually become home. Their numbers were probably reduced to less than 300. So as a result of that Allotment Act, we more or less lost all of our holdings. Yet we were sitting together as a group of people. And John Collier was instrumental in the Indian Reorganization Act. The story is our grandpa walked to all of these meetings and worked really hard to have this place established. And it was established. In the first families moved to this area in 1936, right here. This is headquarters, and this is where they moved. And slowly land was bought. More and more people came up here. We celebrated 50 years, which is another whole story. Since contact, our people had never really been any one place for more than 50 years, and for over 200 years. We just kept moving, moving, moving. And our theme for that 50th year anniversary was, we shall move no more. John Collier was the Commissioner of Indian Affairs during World War II and the Depression years, and was recognized for promoting legislation that supported self-government, cultural preservation, and religious freedom for American Indians. Although flawed, the Indian Reorganization Act proved to be a turning point for Indian rights in that it recognized and respected tribal and cultural diversity and the sovereign status of Indian nations. The Mohicans are referred to as a nation because of their status of sovereignty. Throughout the years of dealing with the United States government, Indian tribes were recognized as sovereign nations, as they are today. You're an independent nation. You can make your own rules to live under. We can make your own laws. We have our own court system. We're not a little town or a little municipality who has to answer to the state of the federal government. We are our own nation of people. And we always have been sovereign. But some of those rights have been taken away from us. So what we have to do is exercise our rights, every opportunity that we can so we don't lose what we have left. There are 11 tribes here in the state of Wisconsin. Some of the tribes have been here. 
since the dawn of time. Other tribes moved into this area. Um, the, the, the Stockbridge Muncie tribe and the Oneida tribe are from the East Coast originally and through a series of uh, forced removals, and that was one of the other federal policies, was the Removal Act, forcing tribes to flee their original homelands and pushing them further and further westward. And, and both the Oneida and the Stockbridge Muncie tribe ended up in the state of Wisconsin. Um, there are six Chippewa tribes, six Chippewa bands here. There are the Menominee tribes, and there's also the Ho-Chunk Nation and the Potawatomi Nation as well. There's a lot of similarities in, in where, um, <clears throat> but there are a lot of differences. I think the Stockbridge Muncie tribe has a, has a longer historical record of contact in working with Europeans than do some of the other tribes here in, in the state of Wisconsin. And, and so that speaks to a lot of issues about relationships. And I think that largely that we have strong relationships uh, with non-tribal people. Uh, we probably tend to be a, a more progressive tribe. And, and by that I mean that we're able to adapt um, perhaps a little quicker than some of the other tribes who don't have such a long historical record of contacts with non-tribal people. And, and that's an important distinction. Um, but I think that still, at the end of the day, we're all tribal people, and there are a lot of similarities among our tribal communities. Today, the population on the reservation is growing. So are the number of tribally run services and businesses, like the beautiful Pine Hills 18-hole golf course and clubhouse facility with a restaurant and banquet hall. Businesses like the Konkapot Lodge are owned and operated by tribal members. I'm, I guess I'm at an age where I can remember how it was when I was young. There were no jobs here. When I graduated from high school, I had to move away from the reservation to find work. And I remember my father worked all week off the reservation and came home only on weekends. There were no jobs here. There were no opportunities here. We didn't even have jobs in our tribal government back then. And now we have uh, employment for everyone. We have the housing program. We have a new clinic. We have um, opportunities for our children for education. They can go to, to college and be fully, almost fully funded. And they can get employment during the summer when they're on break from college. The tribe promises them jobs. They have wonderful opportunities now that they didn't have when I was, was young. The casino has made possible a whole bunch of other things, not only the development of this uh, library museum, where we're trying to gather everything there is to, known about us. It's also improved our roads and our housing and our educational system, our daycare. Um, people have jobs. I think it has given us a new kind of freedom. We have an 18 hole golf course and all those kinds of things. But I hope that we don't get hung up on what the money in the casino will do and that we uh, let's put a priority on the cultural development and spiritual development, social development. And that's a big issue right now in our community. There are a lot of things we've got to do for our kids and our families to help them become strong and respectful and relating appropriately to one another. The gaming revenue has made wonderful changes in the community in many ways. We have a new clinic, we have public safety, we have our own police officers where we get better treatment. It used to be you call an officer, it took them a half an hour to get out here. By then, whatever was going on is over. So it's different now. We have fire department. We have all these government programs. We have youth programs. We have a beautiful gym and weight room, which means health can take a, a little bigger emphasis there. People that maybe didn't think about working out are working out. People are walking at treadmill. They're being able to get a little healthier because of it. The Stockbridge Muncie Health and Wellness Center is a prime example of some of the recent improvements being realized on the reservation. The new health center includes a comprehensive list of healthcare services, including 
dentistry, community health nursing, diabetes clinic, women's health, mental health, and an on-site pharmacy. In addition to its workout facilities and exercise classes, the Mohican Family Center hosts many family-oriented and community events. It is also the location of family services and a satellite campus for the College of the Menominee Nation. Recently we celebrated Wachinden, which means feasting together. This is a ceremony that we recreated in our community, loosely based on the New Year ceremony that is, is written in some traditional documents as documented by an anthropologist. We um, keep the fire going for 12 days and nights. There's one night it's, it goes out and then it's rekindled to symbolize the New Year. It's, when the fire goes out, it's to let go of all the past bad feelings you have or anything like that. And when it's rekindled, it's to start out fresh in our community. Um, a lot of other things happen, but probably we tease each other a lot, but the word is feasting together. We do do that every single day. Potluck, everything kind of revolves around food. One night our particular planned activity didn't turn out so well, but we sat down and ate together. So at least we did what we did what we were supposed to do for that one night. I think it has helped. It's now been going for nine years and it's become a tradition. Ceremonies like Wachinden are especially important to children. It is the children who will ultimately be responsible for keeping the traditional ways alive and meaningful. I think it's important just basically because every Native American should know about their culture. Sometimes it helps you out when you're struggling and you're depressed. It just probably helps you out. And I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, about John Quinney. During the 12 day celebration, children are read the John W. Quinney July 4th Address, which in many ways symbolizes the spirit of what Wichindan is really about. On the 11th day, a powwow is held to celebrate the conclusion of this annual event. Wichindan is a ceremony for healing. You can pray, just like church. No, you do a sin and you go to confess. It's just the same. You pray, you uh, give thanks also. I lived on res all my life. And uh, I've been dancing since I was six years old, drumming since I was about 11, 12. Drumming and singing is like a way of life for me. I grew up singing all my life and drumming and uh, singing and dancing. You know, go to Paul's with your family and meet up with your friends and it's just something I do just part of life now. I can see it already. Our youth are more interested in history and traditional ways. They're always asking us what clan we belong to, and uh, we're starting some of our original, our traditional ceremonies back. And I think it's our youth that's going to be doing this because our parents, our grandparents, were brought up in a Lutheran mission, and, and they're really schools. government schools, and they're really Christianized and. Um, I think our youth are more interested in traditional ways. So yes, I, and I even think someday the language is going to come back because we have kids that ask about that too and we have people here that yeah, I think can, us. you know, help. Uh, hopefully that will come back too. Today, it is common for the reservation's children to go on to college or technical school. Tribal members hold degrees in law, medicine, education, and fine arts. The Mohicans of Stockbridge, Muncie, perceive their whole community as one extended family. Maybe that's why humor has become such a prominent part of their identity. Or maybe it's because to survive the countless hardships they encountered, laughter became a technique for survival. Whatever the reason, visitors to Stockbridge, Muncie will undoubtedly be affected by the closeness of its people. Visitors to the reservation can also learn more about the distinctive Mohican history by visiting the Arvid E. Miller Memorial Library Museum. Among the many artifacts is an original Bible that was first given to the Stockbridge by the Prince of Wales more than 250 years ago. Weatuck Mohican Village represents a traditional way of life before the arrival of the Europeans. What you need to do is to get to know us. 
you need to get to know me as, as, as a tribal leader, as a tribal person. You need to get to know our tribal community. We're forever encouraging and inviting people to come into our community. One of, uh, one of my personal goals is to sort of demystify the reservation experience for non-tribal people. A lot of people know us now, uh, but they know us through our casino and they tend to define us as tribal people through our casino. And that's only one part of the story. We operate like seven major divisions in our tribal government from healthcare uh, and other economic uh, initiatives like the Pine Hills Golf Course or our Little Star Gas Store. But we have a family center, we have a museum and a library. We have about 60 programs in social services and education and elderly and youth programs. Uh, there's a lot to us and we want people to know that. And we want them to, to get to know us, to understand us, and to know that there are some differences, certainly. But those are not differences that, that have to raise barriers between us as people. Well, I think that was a little better way than me making a, a lecture to tell about our people. Um, I thought at this point, if there's some points you want to talk about, some questions you might have, uh, we can do a little Q&A. And if I can answer them, I will do my best uh, uh, to do that. But it, it, I think it goes to show you that, you know, as a, tr as a tribal people, you have, you have doctors, you have lawyers, you have storytellers. Um, and so we're a community and, uh, um, I think one of the thing that should be emphasized is that I, I, I don't believe that we've ever willingly moved from any of the lands that we lived on. Uh, a few years ago, West Point is our homeland, is our summer grounds. So anytime they put a shovel in the ground at West Point, they contact us in case they find some of our ancestors. So we are a tribe. I know if you take a look at the, a few years ago, um, they used to call them Winnebago's. Why did they call them Winnebago's? Because they lived in Winnebago, Nebraska, but they really were Ho-Chunk people. And why do they call us Stockbridge? Because we lived in a town called Stockbridge. We're Mohicans. We're like the, the Chippewa in Wisconsin were six different bands. We had Mohicans all the way in different bands living all the way from Lake Champlain almost down to Manhattan. Our last council was at Shadak Island, just out of Albany, where we all would come together, the different bands. So, um, and that was reduced to about 300 at one time. It's now 1,500, a little more. Uh, so the Mohicans, the last of the Mohicans live in Wisconsin. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting point a few years ago. We had a group of people from Crossways Camp came to the reservation to help, to help the church there do some things. And I talked to the camp counselors and asked them if they knew about where they were or anything about Mohican people. And they didn't know a thing about them. They didn't know the book, the last, they didn't know a thing. And these were young counselors. So we need to tell our story. Um, and we need to keep that story alive. Uh, sometimes it's not the story that wants to be heard. Um, we, and uh, if, if, if we can't keep that alive as people, we lose something because um, history is, uh, history needs to be told. I know here the other day I was watching uh, this terrible thing that's going on in the world in Ukraine right now. And a part of that history was at one point in time, Russia starved them people. I mean, it, it wasn't that they had lack of food. They took their food. And I told my wife, you know, it's kind of, kind of reminds me of killing the buffalo off. Not a lot of difference. So we as people, Americans, Russians, Ukrainians, need to come together and do this better in the name of our creator.
because we're all responsible for that. And I think that we, as Mohican people, even though we, what's happened to us has happened to us, our creator didn't do that to us. We people did that to us. So our creator put us here to tell our story, to welcome people, to give them our water that we have if they're thirsty, to give them their bread if they're hungry. And no matter the trail, no matter what was before us and maybe what was done to us, we need to keep our head high and continue the lessons that the Creator taught us in, in our place in the world. That's what we're here for. So, uh, having said that, if there's any any other questions or anything I could touch more upon, upon I'm more than willing to do that. Uh, if you have an opportunity to go to the Library Museum, they have a, a lists of books that you can read on us. Um, I don't want to tell you the whole story because I, I probably can't remember all the dates and the eight movements that we have. Uh, but I also don't believe that the Oneida people willingly gave us a place to come to that was probably negotiated by the federal government. I don't think the Menominees gave up their land. All those things were done uh, because people wanted something that we had. And I believe, uh, if, and if you want to just take a short look at Divide and Conquer Works, uh, some of those things went on up in Alaska right now. So it's when they hit that oil up there, they made like corporations up there and they did, did, they did the same thing. So I guess the point I'm trying to say is that people, I think are people, and we, we live in a, a global world and we need to take care of each other. Amen, That's my brother. 50 cents. <laughs> That's my 50 cents. So is there any questions or anything else I can answer? We have some books here uh, a few years ago. And I, I, I you know, I, I, I love my, you know, I, I always say that somewhere in this world, there's blonde haired, blue eyed, Aborigine people. And uh, we've had some great people that come. And if I could adopt them into the Indian world, I would. <laughs> A few years ago, we had a couple professors came out of uh, one out of Indiana and one out of Florida, and they revived Mohican hymns. And we at our church where we go to sang those hymns in Mohican. And those hymns hadn't been sung for 250 years. And the energy in the room at the time, however, I don't think our ancestors probably recognized any of the words, <laughs> but we did our best. And just the energy of our ancestors in that room could be felt. And it was amazing. And that was brought by a couple of professors that were just interested in the Mohican people. So there's a few books here uh, that, you can get a list if you go to the museum. I'll leave a list here that they uh, recommend that you might want to read. Uh, I've read most of them. Uh, they're all pretty good. Um, I always say I lived on the reservation all my life, all my 69 years. And my mother and father always taught me when we would go or we'd have a question, they always taught me the way that they learn from their heart. And they would say, you know, that may be the way people see it, but you have to make that decision yourself. And they always gave me a way to make a decision based on, on facts, basically for family and community. So um, the good red road and the good blue road, that's the question. And sometimes you're always the good red road is the red is the road of the community, and you have to make that decision. Do you make the decision for yourself that affects just you, or do you make the decision for the community? And sometimes some of us never leave the intersection. <laughs> We're always there faced with that decision or, or struggle with that. But those are the things that I think our, our ancestors taught us uh, along the way. 
Is there any questions? Can I just start going to uh, talk for one minute and then I'll be quiet. Uh, just an advertisement um, for you know what's coming up. I'm developing a list of resources. Um, so anything can be sent to me that I'll start to put that together and that'll be a link uh, that we'll have. And then also on May 15th, we hope to come up to the reservation. And I, every time I see this celebration of eating together and those kinds of things, this is what we want to culminate this whole thing with. Yeah, thanks for that preview of hopefully coming attractions, <laughs> you. Yeah, Anita, I think you had a question. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. The joy of Zoom. I wanted to ask how tribal people feel about the school systems presentation in Wisconsin. I understand there always is a time in the school year in Wisconsin to study indigenous people. But how does the tribe feel about those classes? I think you're probably talking about Act 31, I would imagine. I think so. I didn't, I haven't lived long in Wisconsin. Okay, Act 31 was actually implemented by one of our tribal people. Uh, we lobbied to get that in the school. Uh, hmm, I think it's something that continually needs to be worked on. Uh, not long ago, the Indian Child, I, I'll say this to explain a little bit, the Indian Child Welfare has been a federal law since, whoa, a long time ago. And basically what that means is that whenever an Indian child is put up for an adoption, the Indian tribe who that affects has to be notified. That was just codified in Wisconsin's legislature about Within the last 10. Within the last 10 years, I testified to get that. So the state, just because of the law, didn't mean that it was happening. And just because Act 8, I think we've done better, but I think we could do much better. Uh, we, a tribe now have gone, we as a tribe have gone out, I think one of the ships that, Christopher Columbus came over, was a Voyager, one of them? Mm. 69 year old, you kind of forget. But we did a, in the Voyager was one of the ships, I believe that Christopher Columbus came over here with, or maybe Henry Hudson, excuse me. Henry Hudson, excuse me. And they take out seventh and eighth graders on that boat and for a sail and, and they teach. We've created a curriculum for that boat. Uh, that they teach on that boat now. That curriculum is pretty good, but trying to get that into a school system, you have to run into home rule, which is a school board. And sometimes there's where the uh, fly in the ointment or the stick in the mud happens. So Act 31 is, was an intentional process to do that but it could be improved on in its implementation would be my reflection on that. Thank you. Other questions or wonderings people have? I have one thing just on what Greg was saying about the teaching in the schools. We have one teacher, uh, at Bowler School, Mrs. Mueller, she embraces education. Uh, she's wonderful. And she has opened her arms to um, honoring, teaching Native American uh, history and, um, you know, teaching about the tribe. She just embraces it. If they had a lot of teachers like that, that show the interest and the willingness to, you know, really jump into that if they can do it, how she's embraced it, yeah. And, and to teach the whole story, not, you know, there's some bad history too, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, you have a hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Miller, I was curious about if there are specific um, focus on land, 
of the land back movement here in Wisconsin for the Mohican people here, like um, there are for similar nations in the Dakotas, things like that. Are there specific projects to reclaim specific um, pieces of land either back on the East Coast or, or any of the places that have been your homeland? There's a kind of a two part question uh, answer to that. Where are we currently at? We had two townships, 3672, uh, square miles of land that was um, treaty to us in 1956, 54-56. And uh, in that period before the time we moved upon that land, the General Allotment Act came out, and that came out across the entire United States. So divide and conquer worked. Basically what they told our people is, those of you who want to be citizens of the United States, will get an allotment of 40 acres. Those of you who do not, will not get these allotments. And what happened is of the 72 square miles, only so many of the people wanted to become citizens of the country. And so only two miles across one section of that property, one township was allotted. Since that was all, was all lost through various reasons. That's where in the, in the film, they talked about John Collier coming up with the IRA Act, the Indian Reorganization Act in about 1937, because Indians were at that time landless and homeless. And also coincided with about the depression area. A lot of these areas were logged off by the large timber barriers. It was full of pine. The pine was slicked off. So they were able to purchase back a total of 13,000 acres in our case. And they only had enough money for 2,500 acres of the 13,000. The federal, at the time, the FSA, Federal Securities Act Agency, came in and loaned the Department of Interior money from their agency, which they were actually under the same division, to buy. 13,000 additional acres for the total of 15,000 with the intent that the FSA lands would be turned back over for tribal lands. Well, that was 1937. Those 13,000 acres were not turned over until 1974, which caused a big problem on the reservation because we had homes built on there people would, it was basically the, the status of the 13,000 acres was like U.S. Forest Service land. Anybody could come and use it, do what they want to use it. And we had no control over that until 1974. Currently, out of the original two townships, I would say we own about 22,000 acres that we bought back at a huge price. And a lot of it we bought back from individuals as it comes up for sale. We bought back some from uh, lumber companies. I think one of the last purchases we made was about for 700 and some acres. That was close to $6 million. So we're trying to buy back because we're getting more and more people coming back to the reservation to buy within our original boundaries of the reservation here currently. Now, Back in New York is another thing. We've purchased some lands back in there. And this, the, um, a few years ago, I'm talking 10 years ago, New York was broke. And they wanted us to come back and establish a casino there. Uh, so we purchased some land there. We had a land claim out there. And in our land claim, we didn't want a casino. We wanted where our ancestors were buried. Uh, I don't care what you hear, what you saw, or where it was. To the stock pe people, it was never about the casino. The state of New York wanted the casino. We wanted those areas where our people are buried. So in that land claim, that's what we identified all of our sites where our people were buried along the Hudson. 
was building a three-legged stool. The Oneidas have a land claim out there. The Seneca have a land claim out there. The Mohicans have a land claim out there. The state of New York wanted to settle them because if you bought land out there, there was a, a, a on your title to your land, it, it would say subject to the jurisdiction of the land claim of the Oneidas, subject to the jurisdiction of the land claims of the Senecas, and so forth, Stockbridge Muncie. So the, the state wanted to settle it. They were pressuring the federal government. The federal government said to the tribes, their negotiation was, you settle, we want to settle all three, not one at a time. So it was like building a three-legged stool. You get one up and that one would come down and that one would come down and that one would come down. Uh, and so it, it didn't happen, but those were the, the things that we were trying to get back in New York. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, thanks for that perspective and history. You're welcome. So I guess my one of my many questions that is formulating. I'm wondering how, from what little I know of of um, other indigenous peoples, a lot of times how the federal government just like defines tribal like belonging to a tribe versus how indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Um, define being a part of the tribe. Is there uh, like a different difference there for y'all? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's a big problem on many, many reservations, yeah. including ours. Uh, right now, our constitution defines our membership list as people who can prove they're a quarter blood. Mm -hmm. And that that's a definition came from the federal government. Right. That was in a John Cooley or 1937 a constitutions that was sent out. Uh, is that what tribes agree with? Probably you'll get about a hundred. If you got, we got 1500 members, you probably get 1500 different opinions. Of right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd have mine, don't know if it's right or wrong. But tr traditionally tribes, no matter, and the tribes took, took slaves. We did it too, from other tribes. Mm -hmm. um, we took women from other tribes. Tribes did those things. I guess what I'm trying to say, people are people. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't have enough numbers to affect anybody else. But usually when they come in and you become a part of our community, you became our community and there was no blood quantum associated with that. Yeah. Um, you might not have been able to attain a certain position within the tribe, but you were looked at as, now times are different. If you need to kill a deer, you need to gather berries, the more the merrier. Yeah. So comparing what we used to do back there, comparing to what we do today is a little different story. Yeah. So it's a question that native people need to come together and decide how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Until that time, you have to live with the constitutional question that you got. Yeah. So um, I think those are discussions. I don't know if anybody looked at the latest U.S. Constitution. There's a whole lot of people out there say they're Indian, and no one knows who they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's a question in the Native communities right now. Yeah. So yeah. good question, though. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. Other questions? Anita, you've got another one? You're muted. Do Native people consider themselves as dual citizens of the big U.S. and of their tribe? Or because so many fought for our country over the many years. How, how do Native people look at that? Thank you for that question. I, I consider myself a citizen of my tribe. I consider myself a citizen of my township. I consider myself a citizen of the county, of the state, and of the U.S. Our numbers, uh, we fought with the British to drive the French to Canada. We fought with the colonies to drive the British from our lands here. This is our home. This is our home. This, this, this is our home. And I think you'll see that the numbers per capita that join 
the armies are much, much higher in native communities because this is our home. This is our homeland. We're the Ukrainians who are getting the big thing right now for that. We fought just as hard for our, for our homeland. Uh, matter of fact, if you'll go into Queens, actually the governor, when we were trying to do our land settle out there, he all, one of the big things in the papers out there was we were uh, non- we were non-New Yorkers coming to New Yorkers trying to settle a land claim. And in Queens, New York, in Cortland Park, there's a big statue that was put there, not by us. I always tell a story that, I shouldn't tell a story, I stole it. <laughs> that there was a lion and a man walking in the park discussing who was the strongest. And as they were discussing that, we were walking along and they came to a statue where a man was riding the lion and the man goes, aha, the man is the strongest. And then the lion goes, no, that just proves that us lions had nobody to sculpture anything. <laughs> if you go to Cortland Park, you'll see a statue where our warriors were killed by British soldiers, a British elite unit, uh, the SEAL Team Six, you might say. And that's in New York, but they'll still say, they'll still continue to say we were an outside tribe. Now that he's, hurts deeply, hurts deeply when, when they say that, because it's simply not true. Somebody said, rule of the law. You make the rules, it becomes a law. We have a hard time fighting in the court system. One of our claims out in New York, what they said, uh, one of the lower courts said, you took too long to bring it to our attention. That's why we're throwing it out. I mean, it's just crazy. But logic and law don't sometimes mix very well. And uh, anyway, I guess that would be my answer to that. Any other questions or wonderings? Again, I would welcome you all to visit us. Uh, we do have uh, a Lutheran church there on the reservation. There's a couple of churches. We do have a Lutheran church there. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, you've been welcome. <laughs> you've been there before. We've had some of us, yeah. Some of you there. And uh, we welcome, welcome you. We always got a cup of coffee and a crust of bread that we're willing to share. Um, we're in the sugar bush right now making maple syrup. Um, but, you know, um, again, you're always welcome. You're coming Wednesday, and that has been, you talked to Pastor Paul about that, so he'll get the word out. So uh, you'll probably be down at our sugar bush at some point in time, too, from the museum. So um, I Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and uh, share with you um, and put this on. And so thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you for your, your time and knowledge and sharing. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, would yeah. you all mind if I close in prayer? Would that be all right? Yeah. All right. The Lord be with you. Also, Good and gracious God, we thank you for today, for the beautiful sunshine and spring peeking through. Uh, we thank you uh, for Greg and his family uh, for coming and sharing uh, their story and wisdom with us. Um, we thank you uh, for the relationships that have begun and hopefully will continue um, as, as we continue to learn, uh, learn more and uh, find ways to work together for the good of all. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, what weekend is it? Oh, August second, second, second or third. August. Yeah, they have an annual powwow the second week in August, which everybody's welcome. It's a community powwow. Uh, it's not a competition powwow. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of good food and a lot of good visiting. Uh, you're more than welcome to come to that. Um, so we we welcome people. Uh, as our ancestors did with Henry Hudson and all those people that come. Um, I, you know, I, one thing, 
I always have a hard time doing is when we pray to bow my head. And it's not in reverence to Patamawas, our creator. It's that we as Native people bowed our heads and got stuff taken from us. Mm -hmm. So I always like to keep my head up and see who's talking to me. Um, I apologize for that. I don't but think there's anything wrong with that. It's just something I can't, I can't get over. Understand yeah. When I pray with my middle school confirmation students, I invite them to take a posture of prayer, whatever that looks like for okay. them. So I apologize. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no need to apologize. Yeah, absolutely not. All right. yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, and next week, same time, same place, uh, <laughs> as we continue learning together. So I hope you all can get out and enjoy the sunshine before it snows again, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. only March. It's going to snow again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone. All right. Thank Thanks you all. all.